Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this session. We are the Hadoop Young team from uh, Uber Data Infrastructure. Today, we'll share the main challenges and the solutions to run Young reliably and efficiently in Uber during the past few years. First, allow, uh, please allow me to introduce our team. Uh, this is Fan. I mainly focus on Young resource management and cluster monitoring. Shu Yi is our containerization expert will share how she revolutionized the cluster management using Docker and how to continuously scale Young. Prashan is our compute and scheduler expert will talk about some of his contribution to improve Young reliability. Han Xiong and Feng Guang mainly focus on resource efficiency will share how they dynamically adjust the queue resources to balance the utilization and the reliability. Uber is operating in 69 countries and over 1,900 cities. There are about 1.5 million concurrent sessions. Last year, uh, about 25 million trips per day. Last year, there were about 5 billion trips in total. In Uber, batch data processing and analysis are very important, also very challenging at this scale. Here is a list of typical type of jobs, like have queries, spark and map reduce, machine learning jobs, and uh, Uber's streaming analytical platform, Athena, is also running on top of Yang. Our customers are from almost every organization, such as data ingestion, uh, Uber Eats, Maps, forecasting, fraud, there are so many more. Hadoop Yang in Uber is one of the largest deployment in the industry. There are more than uh, 17,000 nodes across multiple data centers serving more than 400,000 daily jobs and provide three nights of availability SRA. There are several, product, there are several production clusters and the partitions and more than 2,000 queues. Now, we're going to dive into each main challenges and the solutions in different areas, including young resource and the cluster management operations, reliability and the efficiency. The first section is about why we need to and how we improve the young resource management operational efficiency. We have multiple production clusters, partitions, and over 2,000 queues. For each cluster and partition, we need to distribute and charge back resources across organizations to support both planned business growth and ad hoc requirement. We used to get hundreds of queue related customer tickets, such as new queue requests, for property change, or a resource request. Most of these tickets and the need collaboration between users, organization admins, and young team. This back and forth discussion took hours to days and cost a high operational cost. To reduce operational cost and improve support efficiency, we launched a new resource management system Internally, we call it YRM. Here is a quick overview of YRM functionalities. First, it then decentralized the queue management to organizations and admins. Young team no longer need to be involved in most of this customer ticket. Only, uh, we also add permission control. Only authorized admin can manage queues. The system reveals all queue properties and the uh, capacities to admins and users. Uh, this system can manage capacity for both default partition and labeled partition. And it provides a solid foundation for future projects such as dynamic max and the future global quota management. Let's take a look at the UIs. Uh, this UI is used to manage a cluster resource by cluster admins such as the young team. And then they, uh, to distribute the cluster resource uh, to each organization. And then organization admin can further allocate capacity to their team queues. This UI is used by organization or queue admins. Uh, they can add new queues, update, updating existing queue properties, allocating capacities, and setting queue ownership. Um, it can, the first tab is uh, all queue properties 
the other tab is the minimum and the maximum recalls and the memories. There are a few types of rules in YRM. The first one is the clustered mean. Like I just said, clustered mean will allocate the cluster capacity to organization. The second row is the organization mean. They can further distribute all the capacity to private queues. The third row is queue admin. Queue admin can manage the sub queue properties, allocate the parent queue capacity to sub queues, and they can preview all of the queues actual number of recalls in the memory. This row is young users. User can view all queue property and capacity just like admin. The only difference is users don't have the permission to edit the queue properties or capacities. Overall, YM has achieved great improvement in operational efficiency. After it was launched, it got around 4,000 access from admin and users in the H2. And because of the transparent and self-service, young customer ticket were decreased by 90%. And this also significantly improved the queue-related ticket resolving time. Um, okay, that's all for your uh, resource management. Next, uh, we're going to move to uh, move on to the next uh, section for young containerization. Shui, over to you. Sure, uh, thanks, Tracy. So next part, uh, I'm going to talk about the containerization uh, young infra uh, infrastructure effort. Uh, so with a growing uh, in complexity of the size of the young infrastructure, uh, it's very difficult for the team to manage the uh, cluster using scripts, CLI commands. So as well as like we have a, a multiple, uh, so many like customer requests for adding and uh, or upgrading the job related life uh, libraries or dependencies. Sometimes with many like uh, in place mutation uh, of production holes and misconfigured uh, or manage the configuration. So led to like instant a few months later. So we take initiative on the yarn containerization effort back in 2019. So when we start containerization effort, we're running with the 2.9 version since we really tie, have a, like a high tie dependencies on the uh, version 2.x by different teams, uh, by uh, also systems including Hive, Spark, etc. So we decided to uh, so to use the version 2.9, which supports the Docker runtime container and back for several patches from the version 3.x. So the container, uh, like young containerization include, uh, includes two parts. One is node management container and like uh, application containerization. So we keep the, uh, like next slide. So we keep the node management container as lightweight as possible with a minimal environment for the image. We only install like Java 8, bin I had a binary debugging tools. And sometimes we have uh, like, uh, uh, we fetch the configuration during the wrong time. So that's it. So we move all the job related dependencies and libraries to the application container, which I will talk later. So uh, we have two options of the, to run the node manager, uh, node manager along with the application containers. So one is Docker in Docker and one is the Docker out of Docker. So Docker in Docker, which is application container run, uh, running as a nested container inside a node man container. So with uh, our like a further investigation, we found out this approach not only brought much more complexity, but also also, uh, uh, like uh, application container will tightly depends on the node man container. So in other words, so when we uh, like do any of the maintenance on the node man container operation, like restart, upgrade, it will impact on the running applications. So to bypass the complexity and the, uh, be capable of managing uh, the lifecycle of the container uh, without affecting the application uh, with. Uh, with without affecting the customer jobs. So we go with a sibling container option. So how does it work? Uh, next slide. So um, so when the node man container uh, being launched by the head worker, uh, this provided by our in-house cluster management platform. So the whole like uh, the host the Docker socket is mounted to the node man container, and the node man process will uh, is uh, is running within the Docker containers. So in this way, and then node manager will launch the application container by the yarn itself. So in this way, it enables the customer application containers to be launched as a sibling. Link container. So let's move on to the application containers. 
So the um, the the benefits of the application containerization is provide a huge flexibility for the customer to, so that they can bring their own like a Docker image to the, run their job. So uh, we also set up or configured the C group parent for the node manager container and, and application container so that it can strict the overall uh, like uh, resources, including CPU and memory utilizations. And so, and also it can help like all the containers, which is like a node man containers and application containers inherit the same like secret hierarchy. So uh, now we have, so at this point we have like node man container and application container running with isolation. So, but there's a one issue we detect. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the node man containers, are, uh, like node managed operation can have very minimal impact on the application container. However, all the application container will become orphan containers when the node manager contain uh, container suddenly uh, unresponsible or crash before the risk, uh, before the yarn able to clean up, uh, run the clean up process and do the clean up itself. So it, so to resolve this issue and then we uh, inject the Docker label to the known, all the known manager container and application containers. And there's uh, and there's an external process uh, uh, scan and do the batch clean up on, uh, on the pre, uh, our, our predefined labels to do the house whipping. So we also have a like a sidecar container for some uh, to do some like housekeeping process, including the log and truncate, and and there's another important part is the Docker image pre pooling process. So it will reduce the application container launch time. So like when we do the uh, like launch the container in the Docker, so there's no such that like Docker pool process, which uh, we detect like based on research is actually uh, take a long time. So which slow down the like container launch. So, and the next slide. So, so they, um, uh, so far uh, with current st uh, stage, we've already like successfully uh, migrate to the old containerized platform with a uh, 60% of the Uber Yarn fleet with 9,000 like um, uh, actually more uh, nodes. And we've been, even with this uh, like number without fully migrated, we already seen a huge improvement of the operational efficiency on the host management. So uh, next uh, I will hand over to Prashant to talk about our reliability. Thanks. Uh, thanks Yui for talking about containerization. So hi, I'm Prashant. So I will be talking about uh, some of the reliability efforts that we have done uh, in our YARN cluster. So as Shui mentioned, we have containerization uh, to solve a big deal of use cases for a lot of our customers. Also, we need to, with so much big fleet of uh, uh, size of YARN nodes, we have a good way to manage reliability and operational efficiency. So I'm going to talk about some of the major high level items that we have done to achieve uh, reliability for our customers. So uh, they lie mostly in two bucket. One is a stress node, which is uh, which falls in bucket of isolation. And one is interqueue preemption, which lies in the bucket of, uh, it's also isolation, but at more granular level. So uh, next slide, please. So on the stress node, this is something which we have developed in house. Uh, so the high level idea is that there are a lot of times job is timing out they are failing and they are SLA misses because some node is running very hot. While traditionally we have controls like CPU, C groups, uh, CPU, IO, but what we, uh, IO, C groups, but what we have found that since in our cluster they were not, uh, from day one, they were not uh, initialized. It was very hard to introduce C groups in later part of the uh, life cycle of YARN cluster. So we have to come up with a novel way to design this. Uh, isolation also what we have observed though we have good uh, a good uh, amount of understanding of c groups on cpu on disk io we have not done that much of uh, we, we we were not very confident of, to enable c group so we have come up with uh, alternative way to achieve isolation and then i am going to talk about the uh, some of the preemption related effort that we did so next slide 
so on the high level uh, what is a stress node so a stress node is a a feature where we want to detect some particular node managers as stressed uh, stress is defined as a parameter which is tunable which is configurable via some of the properties and using stress we want to give feedback to resource manager basically not to schedule any job and rm uses this uh, feedback to further improve scheduling the way it does i'm going to talk about in the next slide so basically what we have done is we have defined some high level of parameters in in a configurable file for example cpu is one parameter where we say if average busy cpu is greater than 85% for say x period of time in our case it's 10 minutes but we have made it configurable similarly we have io like average disk io is greater than 90% and we can add any sort of uh, the parameters that we want and we have actually exported all this in a property file uh next slide please so uh what happens is there is a existing node health checker framework which is already provided by uh, open source yarn so we leverage that open source framework uh, just that we plug in our script to check all these parameters and detect if a node is stressed or not once this framework detects if a node is stressed then it uses existing nmrm protocol and the health checker script reports that a node is stressed so via this means we have not introduced any new wire dependency it's just that we are le leveraging the existing nmrm feedback and add adding an additional state which is called stressed uh, and this this keeps on running periodically so for example if we get some data points like subsequent for 10 minutes data points if we say all the time it is stressed then we consider it as a stress and then this will go to rm so how we handle it at the rm layer is i am going to talk about next so rm internally created a new state virtual state kind of a stressed state for the node manager this is again based on the feedback from the agent that i talked about and this case what the rm does it it puts the node as non schedulable so the good idea behind making it non schedulable is that it uh if there is an existing job which want to schedule this node will be skipped in the scheduling cycle and the node will go to the another uh, another node uh, the advantage is that it will let the current jobs that were running on those container to also drain without overburdening the resource manager uh in this case what will happen is that for the period of time till the node is stressed rm will th think that this is non schedulable level while this decreases overall fleet of nodes schedulable nodes but we have also uh, provided a means to configure a threshold like for example in your cluster you can do the analysis of allocation demand versus the availability based on this this parameter is configurable so you can add a threshold we have also added a threshold also subsequently once an uh, nm detects that it is not stressed it will report it back to rm and rm will take the decision to mark it non uh, schedulable again so it will go via go back to its original route so next slide so this uh, this is high level idea what we did for achieving isolation with respect to busy nodes uh, this is a graph that we added in our cluster like uh, also this is per partition just to give an idea uh, it's not like uh, because we have node label partition in our cluster so here what we see is that uh, and any period of time how many nodes are stressed in each partition so we see that at some point like in our big biggest partitions many times more than 100 nodes go stressed which shows that there are many nodes which have actually are in worse condition and potentially would have solved would have held the job and the second uh, metrics that we use for this is the improvement percentage improvement in throughput of the jobs so that is another graph that we have captured right now it's not here it's uh, internal to us but what we have observed is that our jobs uh, the throughput of the jobs that the throughput is like amount of jobs that we are running at particular point of time uh, they have increased 20% after we introduced this new feature so this is about stress nodes uh, i'm going to talk about interqueue preemption second so this is something which open source already has the reason we bring this slide is because uh we have made some observability changes specific to our cluster and also some uh, smaller changes uh, to help uh, help 
preemption not uh, basically affect the jobs in negative way so one thing that we did uh, is we have disabled a- am preemption so we don't want a job to die uh, because of preemption because at am level there will be retry so we want that to happen second uh, what we have actually focused more on what could be done for monitoring so that on calls are very much aware of what's going on because since preemption also was not enabled in our cluster and uh, introducing it uh, at later point of time uh, was going to have lot of trouble because customers need to know why their job is slow why their containers are dying so in that case one of the best one of the good things that helped us is uh, how can we explain uh, what happened so what we do is we have extensively um, put all the metrics in m3 like when their queues are going over min and also we have side by side chart of showing when the preemption is happening and also the cluster allocation that time so this way like uh, first of all if uh, there is a on call question or support question like why the job is done, there is a single place to monitor all the jobs uh, all the preemptions and will help us to debug it fast second also one thing which you observed that uh, sometimes the default preemption rate was a little bit aggressive for our cluster so we have also tuned that pre- uh, preemption rate so this helped us uh, achieve reliability in the sense that nobody can use too much resources everybody is gar- uh, constrained by the min guarantees and also there is a better uh, incentive for customers like to increase their quota if they see that they are always going over, over min for certain period of time and their jobs are di- uh, like preempting because of con- uh, because cluster is very busy in that case it's a good charge back uh, story and they can go back and increase their resources so these are some of the high level efforts that we have done for making sure our clusters run uh, reliably uh, i think next i'm going to uh, give it to hengshun and fagwan to talk about a natural extension for preemption where we introduce notion of dynamic max so yeah go ahead uh thanks thanks prashant hi folks this is hanshun from your team here at uber and i'm going to talk about the efficiency and reliability trade-offs uh, next mm-hmm. slide please so cluster efficiency is of top priority here at uber and in high level we are faced with three challenge um, first is how to support more customer with limited resources and then how to avoid half spot and how to ensure customer satisfaction. Next slide, please. Um, the problem we observed is that when the cluster get o- overloaded, there are certain queues are overused, uh, meaning they are always using their maximum capacity. Uh, second is too much preemption could cause cluster instability. And third is bad user experience could happen since existing job might be impacted due to, due to their container being queued. So the solution we brought in is called dynamic max, which literally means dynamic maximum capacity. And dynamic max mediates cluster by encouraging or discouraging preemption. And it could uh, avoid cluster overloading and provide fairness. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at a screenshot uh, of one of our uh, Grafana panel. So if, um, so more resources will be allocated when there is a spike for pending app. Um, in this in this graph, the red line, the red line is the maximum capacity for this particular queue. As we can see, there's a there's a spike for the pending app uh, at uh, around twelve, and the 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 right line is is going up. That's the program. That's what the program is doing to sort of trying to allocate more resources to this particular queue. And then let's let's talk about uh, the implementation implementation uh, for it's like uh, next slide next slide please. So in our first implementation, it was pretty much a config driven decision tree. We have a lot of config values, which including um, like we only allow certain number of change per X hours, and we only allow one change per thirty minutes, and we're only adjusting particular queue when the cluster is not busy. And so on and forth. So basically, we have twenty or something config values to sort of tune. And uh, apart from that, we also have a rollback system, which we call uh, roll, reset back to last human set value, um, because those values are 
mostly is that by administrators in those orgs, they are kind of aware of their resource. So sometimes if we if our program is like adjusting their their maximum capacity to aggressive, uh, their user experience might be impacted. So we that's kind of reason we introduced this rollback mechanism. And when we got a ticket or something, we can simply hit an endpoint to roll back all the changes introduced by the program to the previous human set value. And, and this has given us very high confidence when we run when we are running this program. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Feng Guang mm -hmm. to talk about the next iteration. Come on. Uh, hi, this is Feng Guang from Yang Team. Uh, thanks, Han Jun, for talking about the first phase of uh, Dynamic Max. Uh, so, as he mentioned, the uh, there are two goals for the, uh, the for the Dynamic Max feature. One is the uh, one is the avoid cluster overloading, which is achieved by the uh, by the first phase of the uh, Dynamic Max, and another one is uh, provide fairness. And this one is uh, not achieved by, by the first one. So that's why we introduced the credit-based Dynamax. So next, please. Uh, so for the uh, so basic idea for the credit-based Dynamax is to uh, improve the algorithms of adjusting the max capacity, which 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 is a configure-driven decision tree in the first phase, and. Uh, and this feature is uh, still under implementation. And today, I will introduce the, what we thought about, about the algorithm for now. So the first concept is a uh, is a baseline. To to calculate the the credit, there need to be a base baseline. And uh, instead of using a, a fixed baseline for all queues, uh, we use a per queue based uh, uh, baseline. And also, this baseline are config also config configurable. And uh, currently, for example, currently we are using the queues average utilization in the past seven days as a baseline. And the second concept is a credit, credit balance. And uh, this is a credit a queue can earn and also can consume. And uh, it's a, it should be an integer between zero and uh, uh, upper bound. And uh, the third concept is a maxi maximal credit balance. This is the upper bound. So this upper bound is to prevent the uh, very huge accumulated value, uh, accumulated credit for a, for a single queue. So uh, as as you can see, the, uh, this graph shows the how a queue can uh, earn or can can consume credit. And uh, uh, if the if the current vehicle usage of the queue is higher than the baseline, then the queue will. Uh, per, the uh, no, the lower than the baseline, then the queue will earn credit, earn credit, and up to the uh, maximum credit balance. And if the uh, current vehicle usage is um, higher than the baseline, the queue will burst the uh, credits uh, to the to, to to zero. And if the if the vehicles and uh, if the once the credit are used up, then the vehicles will be. Uh, so to the baseline. So uh, yeah, and uh, this one um, and and uh, here the, there are different levels of uh, precedences of the decision tree when we adjust the max capacity of the queues. Uh, and uh, as a as a graph shows, this decision tree is a hybrid for the traditional uh, threshold based and the credit based. And uh, it and this decision tree will run. Uh, every five, five minutes for now, and uh, there are five levels. And the top priority is uh, available credit, uh, which means that uh, if a queue has has available credits, so it will increase the uh, max capacities for better performance if the cluster is idle. And uh, even and even it's possible to conditionally increase if the cluster is busy. And the second priority is the window of uh, idle time. Uh, the window of idle time means that uh, the max capacity uh, of the queue uh, doesn't get changed for a fixed time window. For example, a uh, couple hours, five hours, six hours. Then the max max capacity of this queue will be reset back to the human set of value uh, if no changes during the uh, this idle window. And the so on is the cooldown time. 
the Kutan time means that uh, the same queue uh, which got adjusted within the, this fixed uh, Kutan time, it won't be adjusted again. So for example, this Kutan time could be 30 minutes for now. And uh, the first one is the queue is busy. Uh, this queue is busy, uh, which means that, uh, um, for example, when the cluster is busy, so uh, the decrease the the queues, which the decrease max capacity for those for those queues who have uh, least credit available. So, and on the other hand, uh, we will increase the increase the max capacity capacity for the queues which has most credit most credits available when the queue is uh, uh, is idle. And the lowest uh, uh, priority is the queue is idle, uh, which means that uh, when, when cluster is busy, if the queue if the uh, the queue is idle, so we will decrease we will decrease the max capacity of these queues queues uh, queues. And um, and uh, with 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 this decision tree, we want to uh, make sure that all queues are treated equally for the when distributing resources through the cluster. So uh, I think that's all for the credit based uh, than max. So I will give the give the mic to Shui. Yeah, so I think we're running out of time, but yeah, so uh, all we mentioned is not end of this uh, our story. Uh, so we continue uh, we continue our journey and the next slide. And uh, so we're growing very fast. We start with only 100 hosts with a single cluster back in 2015. And now together with HDM and Yarn, we have over 12, like uh, 21,000 hosts uh, in our cluster. Uh, together, so one of the, our young majority, uh, like primary cluster, have over uh, like uh, 9,500 hosts running. And one, so next slide. So one of the challenge we are facing right now in the yarn uh, is the uh, scalability. So I've been seeing detecting scheduling slowness over 8,000 hosts uh, when they when it hits the 8,000 host uh, point and the large uh, and with the large exclusive partitions. Also, availability got impact during the RM field over so uh, and it, it sometimes can take uh, like uh, over 10 minutes for the recovery of those applications etc so our next journey starts with a young proxy so which can load balancing the balance the traffic to multiple subcluster based on the routing policy so it can support one logical cluster with multiple subclass physical clusters and also to evaluate the changes and be confident to roll it out to the large fleet with the feature simulation is, becomes very critically important, important so that we can run simulated like the young workflow to scaling the uh, to to afford a scaling test or some EV testing uh, something like this to with any arbitrary uh, cluster size. Uh, and the last part also related things. We use VARM as uh, Fang mentioned earlier to manage resources for the customer jobs. And we don't want to expose the complexity of the, since we have a multiple physical clusters underneath. Uh, instead, it will be only one logic cluster exposed to the customer, which re it will require like uh, the VARM and the proxy integration to uh, like uh, demonstrate only a global quota management. So yeah, uh, I think that's pretty uh, much all of the uh, section we, we want to cover. So next part is like Q&A. Uh, I think we already have some questions. First from Adam, how do you distribute the application container in the cluster? I assume single container registry can be a bottleneck. Uh, so we distribute the Docker image through the Kraken. So the Kraken, Kraken is uh, open source peer-to-peer -peer, uh, Docker like a uh, registry and is original like, uh, developed within Uber. So, and uh, we've, uh, so the Kraken is designed to the Docker uh, image management replication distribution. So basically each of the hosts will have a Kraken agents running and it will basically do this uh, distribution, things like that. So, and uh, so we did a bunch of like testing so we don't see much like latency overhead uh, um, with uh, when we uh, integrate with Kraken. So that's uh, not part of the pro uh, like uh, issue for us after we are uh, onboarded with Kraken. So the next question, um, do you plan to open source or put on gate 
the details on how you put the yarn on the docker and run it. So we do have a couple of like uh, uh, like uh, back for what we'd like to uh, like commits. We'd like to contribute back to the community for the yarn and including the inject the docker uh, label, uh, secret parent, uh, uh, like uh, things like that. So, and for how like one book or some, like uh, some uh, blog, uh, I think we have a blog, but uh, there's no like uh, details like GitHub on how to how the yarn uh, Docker and run it. But I think that's a good suggestion. We should uh, we can definitely consider that and uh, help more to the community. Yeah. So any more questions? I think that's the two. We have four more minutes. I think our time is uh, seven ten to seven fifty. Is there any other question? Should we just stay here and uh, or leave actually? Uh, I think we can, we can stay here until 750. Um, okay. <laughs> I think we got a new question, should we, from Michael. Okay. Uh, do you have plan to migrate to Young3 on Docker? So, yeah, we, we uh, 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 at the beginning, we uh, when we start the effort, we actually want to uh, start with the 3, since there are more like better support on the 3. The thing is like, we have a tight dependency on the all like from the clients. So that's why we kind of like trade off and then decided to go with the 2.1. But however, we do have a one cluster, but this is for other a special case that we have 3.2 uh, running. Uh, uh, and we are now working on exploring and to do the dockerization, things like that to onboard jobs. So we are actually doing this effort, but uh, it won't be like, uh, the, it will only apply for the new uh, jobs or new use cases we are onboarding now, but it will, uh, at the short term, uh, we won't uh, migrate uh, the existing cluster to the two, uh, like a three, to the version three. It will be a huge effort, I think. Yeah, may I ask Michael, uh, which team or which company are you working for? Are you running Young3 or? Audience speak to you. Yeah, I think the it's not like an interactive session. Okay. Right, Prisha. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, maybe just ask that question on okay. chat. Maybe. Uh, Uh, there's a question for uh, to Prashant. You mentioned isolation. Uh, were you referring resource isolation or resource stress to nodes such that no new task can be scheduled um, to those hosts? Yeah, so it's a kind of uh, one followed by second. So, for example, if uh, a particular node has like a lot of uh, high CPU, high I/O. That can be like if a single job is using a lot of CPU, because as I said earlier, we have not enabled C groups, right? So there could be possibility that a single job can like uh, make uh, a node busy. Then in that case, we isolate that node kind of, and then that node will uh, not be scheduling new jobs until it is non-stressed. So that's 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 what we we are doing for stress nodes. Okay, I think uh, it's seven fifty now. Is there any more question? Oh, there's one more from Michael. Shui, can you take it? 
Uh, no. So uh, the question is, do you, do you use Yarn GPU or Docker? If not, see any particular challenge? So with the current uh, setup, no. The answer is we don't use this. And then we we do see the custom requests on this. So we are starting exploring with the, um, like a bunch of like a, a stakeholder from machine learning teams. And then, but the we in the short term we don't have a plan to onboarding this. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And we don't so far with the current migration, uh, we don't see the degradation on the job or like a longer running or overhead. We don't see this issue. Okay. Uh, if no more questions, I think uh, that's it for this session. And thank you again for joining this session and uh, the questions. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye.